Good morning. How you doing? Hot? Well, you're in the shade, so you're cheating a little bit. Hey, listen, again, my name is Sean Patterson, and I'm a community group leader and uh, one of the members of the teaching team here. And listen, I just want to start off by saying that I'm, I'm just so glad to see your faces as I speak today. Like, I, like it's better than, than seeing an X on a wall. Now, I don't know if you guys knew how the experience was for those of us who were doing these services with no audience, but we had cameras on us. Ben, you knew this. We had cameras that are on us, and then right in between the cameras is an X on a wall, and you had to look right at the X and preach your heart out to it. And, and so I just want to start off by telling you guys, you guys look a lot better than an X on a wall. Matter of fact, just help me out for a moment. Look at someone and say, you're a lot better looking than my ex. <laughs> healing. Healing is already happening in the house. Healing is already happening. Listen, I, I'm honored to close out a series that we have been calling Character in Crisis. Uh, we've been anchored in the book of First Peter, uh, a book that I've conveniently renamed uh, How to Survive 2020 Starter Pack. That was supposed to be funnier. Cool. I'll talk to the people that are streaming then. And uh, th this book, 1 Peter, is about perseverance. It's a book about suffering. But more than that, it's about how we, as the people of God, endure and handle suffering. You know, I heard it said a long time ago that uh, it's in prosperity that we meet our fans. Uh, it's in poverty that we meet our friends. But it's in pain that we meet ourselves. C.S. Lewis said it this way. He said that God whispers to us in our pleasures. He speaks to us in our conscience, but he shouts to us in our pain. So you see, suffering has uh, th this ability to develop Christ-likeness in us. Uh, it's a, a sort of schooling for our souls that teaches us how to depend on God, not our circumstances. And so Peter is writing this letter to struggling Christians who are scattered all throughout Asia Minor, uh, who are about to embark on a, a persecution of believers that is uh, infamous. It's, it's one of the most famous persecutions of Christians that our world has ever seen. Uh, a persecution that was so intense that it would ultimately claim Peter's life and the life of the Apostle Paul. So what does this mean to us? Uh, what does this mean? Now, when, when I think about suffering and response to suffering, I think about something that happened to me in my childhood. So just follow me on down memory lane for a second. When I was a child, it was, it was 1989. I was in my aunt and uncle's apartment as a kid. And, and I was dealing with this excruciating pain in my stomach. Uh, what we would later find out was appendicitis. And so I'm laying on my cousin's bed when it happens. Everything begins to shake. And, and not just shake but rumble. I look up from where I lay on the bed and I, and I look at the dresser where, where the TV sits and the TV is violently jumping up and down on the dresser. It was the 6.9 on the Rector scale. $6 billion, 1989 Loma Prieta earthquake that originated in Santa Cruz, 60 miles south of where I lived in San Francisco. I hear my aunt and my cousins run out of the apartment because it was apparent staying inside was way too dangerous. And so I'm lying there, unable to move, in fetal position, watching my world fall apart. And I'm familiarized in that moment with, with an all too familiar scenario. No one to the left, no one to the right. It was just me in this pain. And I, I remember thinking to myself, man, if I can just close my eyes, if I can just make it through this, maybe it'll pass. And sure enough, it did. The damage was done, but it passed. Unfortunately, this would be the way that I handled all trauma, all struggle, all sorrow, all suffering in the future that I would just curl up and I would just watch it and just hope that it would pass. Until 19 years old, I went to a camp and I was on a softball field and I encountered Jesus Christ. And it was in that moment that God began to teach me how to resiliently endure hardship. 
And so Peter, as he's writing uh, this letter to the people of God, he's trying to help them to, to, to understand how to resiliently endure hardship. Uh, it's not enough to just wait out pain and sorrow, right? It's not enough just to ball up and curl up and, and, and close our eyes until suffering passes. No, we're not called to shelter in place spiritually. We're not called to that. Peter says this early in this letter. He says, in all this, you greatly rejoice, though now for a little while you may have had to suffer grief in all kinds of trials. These have come to prove the genuineness of your faith. All right. So what does it look like to be resilient? What does that look like? All right. Like, 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 how can we as the people of God rejoice even when we suffer grief and trials? Thanks for asking. Let me tell you. You know, um, as you read the book of of first Peter, what you see is this theme that goes all across from chapter one to chapter five. Uh, you see in chapter one that Peter talks about how our faith is being tested by fire. In chapter four, he talks about not being surprised when uh, the fiery ordeals come upon us for the testing of us, uh, as if something strange is happening to us. Uh, You see in chapter five, he talks about the devil as a roaring lion lion, uh, trying to to destroy us. And then at the very end of, of chapter five, he refers to Rome as Babylon, right? And so there's this, this theme, right? This, uh, this, this running, uh, a thread that goes on. And so I have to think that as he was penning this letter to these Christians, that he had Daniel and his friends on his mind. He had Daniel and his three friends on his mind. And so what I want to do is just for a bit, I want to look at uh, Daniel and his three friends because I believe they were living representations of resiliency. That, that I believe that, that they were able to put flesh on the things that Peter was talking about in this letter to these Christians. Right, that, that these uh, uh, young men had an experience in exile that can tell us a lot about how we should handle hard times. Are you, guys, are you guys good to ride with me? Are you good to ride? Let me pray. Father, I thank you for the people of God. I thank you that though it's hot, <laughs> you're giving them a great attention span in Jesus' name. Lord, I thank you. You are faithful through the ages, that you are Uh, You said in your word that you were near the brokenhearted, that you saved those who were crushed in spirit. Lord, I thank you that you said in your word that in your presence is the fullness of joy. It's in your presence. It's not in um, our possessions. It's not in our circumstances. It's your presence. And so meet us here, teach us, help us, draw us closer to you. In Jesus' name, and everyone said, amen, amen. So the setting of the book of Daniel takes place in 605 BC uh, when the Babylonians led by Nebuchadnezzar attacks Jerusalem and kidnaps a wave of Israelites and brings them back to Babylon as exiles. Now, among them were four young men uh, that that were royal uh, family. Uh, They were from the family of David. And it was Daniel and his three friends, his three friends whom you probably know from their Babylonian names, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. All right. And so the first three chapters of the book we see uh, what I would call the three tests of resiliency, all right? The three tests of resiliency. And I want you to see this with me. Okay, in the first chapter, Nebuchadnezzar, he he orders that the boys be renamed. He orders that they be taught Babylonian culture, that they be taught Babylonian language, and that they eat Babylonian food. And that all seemed all right to the boys except the food. Uh, Like, have you ever gone over to someone's house and it's like, I can chill with this, but they put food in front of you. It's like, I'm out. Man, y'all are a tough crowd. Ain't nothing funny to y'all. Maybe you haven't been there. Maybe, maybe it was your house. Now, see, if you don't react, I'm going to start bagging on you. All seemed all right. All seemed all right until the food came up. And the Bible says that, that, that they made it up in their minds that they would not defile themselves with the king's food, right? For them to partake, to partake in any pagan feast would be a form of idolatry. It was to them an issue of worship. And so the first test was a test of integrity. Everyone say integrity. See, in hard times, your integrity will be tested. Integrity, by definition, means uprightness in character or action. It's a firm adherence to a code of moral values. It 
implies trustworthiness or incorruptibility. And, and what, I, what I want you to see is that it's interesting to note that it wasn't captivity that tested Daniel's integrity. You know what it was? It was privilege. The, the king was trying to give him all this stuff to prepare him to enter into his service. And Daniel, this, this kidnapped slave, said no. Even in crisis, even in captivity, for Daniel, he chose integrity over compromise. That's the first test. The second test happens in chapter 2. In chapter 2, Nebuchadnezzar has this dream that troubles him. And it troubles him so much because he doesn't understand the dream. And so he calls all of his wise men, all the smart people of the land. He calls them in, the astrologers and the enchanters and the sorcerers. He calls them all in. He says, I want you guys to tell me what my dream is about. And no one can do it. Like, he didn't, he didn't only want them to give them uh, the interpretation. He wants them to give them the dream, too. And they're like, no, no, you got to tell us something. He's like, no, 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 you're so bad. You're so wise. Tell me the dream and the interpretation. And they said, we can't do it. And, and, and I love the response, especially in light of being a New Testament Christian. We believe that God resides in us, yeah? Listen to what they say to the king in that moment. They say, your demand is impossible. No one except the gods can tell you their dream, and they do not live down here among people. He becomes furious, and at that moment, he pronounces a death sentence on all of them, including Daniel and his three friends. And so Daniel finds out about it, and Daniel's like, hold up, hold up, hold up. Give me a few minutes. I will tell you your dream. And he goes back, and he gets with his boys. And in that moment, they could have been caught up in in self-pity. In that moment, they could have been caught up in despair, but you know what they did instead? They prayed. They prayed. This is a test of intimacy. Hearing from God meant for them life or death. So how about you? Huh? If, if, if hearing from God right in this moment if getting direction from God right now was a matter of life and death, would you survive? See, th this is a, a, an issue, I think, right now that's plaguing the people of God. And what's happening is we are too distracted for devotional life. That, that we're so caught up in, in uh, the cares of this world and the deceitfulness of riches and lust for other things that we don't have time for intimacy with God. We don't have time to communicate with him and have communion with him. And if I can just take this a little bit further, can I do a Kanye rant? Is that okay? This is one of my frustrations with where we are today. Because 2020 comes. Worldwide pandemic comes. Racial issues come and flare up. Election year comes. And many of the Christian voices are either surprisingly silent or overly obnoxious. Why is that? I'll tell you why. The reason why is because before you can become a prophetic voice, you must first have a prophetic ear. Daniel said, hold up, hold up, hold up. I will tell you your dream. He goes and he gets his boys and they do a familiar thing. They pray. So the first test of resiliency is integrity over compromise. The second test is intimacy over despair. Third, chapter three is perhaps the most popular story in the book of Daniel. Nebuchadnezzar, he uh, builds this massive uh, idol, this golden statue uh, uh, commemorating himself. Uh, and after he builds it, he invites the who's who of the land to come to a dedication ceremony. He hires out the dopest band to come and play music for it. And before the music starts, they pronounce Anyone who does not bow to their knees and worship this, this idol will be thrown in the fiery furnace. So he wanted everyone to march to the beat of his drum. But the three Hebrew boys weren't having it. And the music started. It started to play. And Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, they stood up. They did not bow down. Someone snitched on them. They found themselves in the presence of the king. And this is what they said to him. When he confronts them about not bowing down, this is what they said. Our God who we serve 
is able to deliver us from a fiery furnace and from you, O king. But even if he doesn't, I love that faith. Even if he doesn't, let it be known, we will not serve your gods or worship the statue you put up. Nebuchadnezzar becomes furious again. He amps up the fire. He ties up the boys and he throws them into the fire. But the Bible says that as he throws them in the fire, all of a sudden he sees four people in the fire. He sees them loose, walking around unharmed. And he says, and the fourth one looks like one of the sons of the gods. See, this third test is identity over conformity. Identity over conformity. Uh, David Kinnaman and Mark Matlock uh, wrote a book called Faith for Exiles, and they speak to this. They said, our society deifies the individual's search for self-expression. Ironically, however, most of us end up looking like the crowd we want to be a part of. You see, the the apparent value placed on self-expression is actually driven by someone else's preferences. Even when we think we're marching to our own beat, we've got an unseen drummer in our heads, keeping time and making claims on our identity. See, this world has a sway about it. There's this tune that it plays to try to get us to capitulate to its tempo and to its order. And so we have to decide what the three boys decided. Are we going to stand or bow? Identity or conformity? Like, are we going to ride with God no matter what it costs? Or are we going to sit this one out and bow down as everyone else does? These three boys, as they watch everyone bow down, either in, in fascination with the idol, the statue, or fear of death. Instead, they as believers had an identity that was so firm that they were willing to be publicly isolated and even executed with no guarantee of deliverance. So what is resiliency? Resiliency is integrity over compromise. It's intimacy over despair. And it's identity over conformity. And and here's the thing about uh, 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 despair. Or excuse me. Here's the thing about resiliency. Resiliency can only be measured when it's in the fire. It can only be measured when it's tested. Uh, 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 David, uh, the, the royal king, of these four boys would later go on to say this. He, he would say, uh, and probably one of my favorite passages, Psalm 23, he said, even though I walk through the darkest valley, I will not fear for you are with me. And so as we close out this series on First Peter, I wanna give you my parting shots on how to walk through the dark valley of suffering, right? Uh, this is how to survive 2020, according to Peter, right? If you're going to suffer, Right? If you're going to suffer as people of God, you need to survive. And this is how to survive suffering in general, but 2020 in particular. Amen. Number one, if you're going to suffer, suffer peacefully. Suffer peacefully. As much as Peter talks about suffering and what it's doing in us and for us, he talks about our conduct in the midst of it. All right? He talks about our conduct. There is a right way and a wrong way to endure suffering. All throughout Peter, you hear him telling us to be sober in spirit in chapter one. He tells us to be holy. He tells us to love one another. He tells us to abstain from fleshly lusts, to submit to authority. He quotes Psalm 34, keep your tongue from evil and your lips from telling lie. Uh, Turn from evil and and do good. Uh, Seek peace and pursue it. In chapter four, he says, be uh, harmonious and sympathetic. Be ready to give an account for the hope that lies within you. Chapter five, he says, humble yourself, resist the devil and flee from him. See, we are called to be persons of peace in a world of chaos. It makes no sense for the followers of the Prince of Peace to be the most anxious and angry people Peter, all throughout this letter, is trying to help us. In this letter, he calls us aliens and strangers. Why? Because he's trying to help us to understand that we need to maintain a posture of peace. Jesus said it this way, Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called sons of God. Just consider this with me for a moment. Okay, consider this for me. 
What if we were intentional about making our political leanings our ministry of reconciliation instead of our battlefields? Y'all are not amen to me enough. Because let me tell you how this goes. Let me tell you the deal. Listen, if your wagon is hitched to Jesus, you will find yourself agreeing with and aligning with all kinds of political camps as you travel through this world. But rest assured, one day at some point, Jesus is going to complicate things and probably get you kicked out. Uh, One of my mentors, uh, KB, Kevin Ware, he said it this way. He said, the fact is we will never be conservative enough. We will never be liberal enough. We will never be woke enough to truly be at home in any of these circles. And there will be parts of your Jesus that will necessarily lead to tension and probably your cancellation. Embrace that. Embrace that. Listen, there's a lot of problems to solve. There are. There's a lot of problems to solve. There's a lot of problems to solve in us. There's a lot of problems to solve in this world. But if it costs you your peace, peace with God, peace with man, it's too expensive. I'm at a point now, I'm just not going to argue with people, especially not on the socials. No, 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 no. If I go through, listen, if you post one plus one equals five, I'm not even going to respond. That's cool. I'm just, I'm not going to argue. Suffer peacefully. Lastly, suffer with perspective. Jesus is the ultimate example of resilience. And when we see and understand what he did for us across, and when we see him dying so that we can live and going through all kinds of suffering and trials, it enables us to suffer in a far greater way because we won't suffer in guilt. We won't say to ourselves, man, man, maybe, maybe God's doing this because he's punishing me. No, 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 Jesus took your punishment. And you won't suffer in anger or self-pity. You won't say, why is God doing this to me? No, no, you'll understand. No, no, God suffered for me and more than me so I can live with him forever. You will understand Jesus as your example. This is what Peter says in in chapter two of this letter. And I love it. He says, for you have been called for this purpose since Christ also suffered for you, leaving for you an example to follow in his steps, who committed no sin, nor was any deceit found in his mouth. And while being reviled, he did not revile in return. While suffering, he uttered no threats, but he kept entrusting himself to him who judges righteously. And he himself bore our sins in his body on the cross so that we could die to sin and live to righteousness. For it was by his wounds we are healed. Look at this with me. Jesus committed no sin. And I'll speak for myself and I'll just say it out loud. It seems like when I'm hurting and when I'm suffering is when I'm most likely to justify sin in my life. But Jesus committed no sin. It says that nor was any deceit found in his mouth. He didn't revile in return. When he was suffering, he uttered no threats, but he kept entrusting himself to him and judges righteously. It seems like when we're hurting is when our mouths are the most dangerous. That that we want to correct things in our flesh, but Jesus put his faith in God in that moment. And Jesus bore our sins in his body. So we tend to think, you know, if we do the wrong thing, it'll create the right results, right? Like like, like if I curse you out, you'll start acting right, right? Like if I withhold love and, and respect from you, you'll love and respect me back. But Jesus didn't do that. Jesus was willing to do the right thing for those who were doing him wrong. He refused to use unrighteous means to produce righteous results. See, if we keep our perspective on Jesus, we keep our eye on him in suffering, our sorrows will not be wasted. But yet our sorrows will produce in us resiliency, beautiful character, and great joy. I'm gonna finish up here. I just wanna give you this last quote. John Stott was an English uh, Anglican priest and theologian. This is what he said about Jesus. He said, I could never myself believe in God if it were not for the cross. Because in a real world of pain, who could worship a God who was immune to it? Jesus suffered peacefully so that we could have peace with God. 
Jesus suffered with perspective. The Bible says, for the joy set before him, he endured the cross, knowing that you and I were his prize. By going to the cross, Jesus chose integrity over compromise. He took on despair so that we could have intimacy with God. Jesus rejected conformity to give us identity. Jesus forfeited the shout of God in his pain. On the cross, Jesus yelled out, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? He rejected the shout of God in his pain so that you and I could have the shout of God in our. Jesus showed us what character in crisis looks like so that we could follow in his steps. And not only is Jesus with us in the fire, but he took the heat, plunging himself into the furnace in order to make us resilient, refined people with beautiful character who have great joy. And so if you're here today and you're struggling, if you're here today and 2020 has ripped you off, or 2020 has ripped the band-aid uh, off of you of, of trauma and pain that's always been there. Or, or if 2020 has revealed your dependence on circumstances rather than God, there is an invitation from the Lord right here, right now. The wrong time for something to happen might just be the right time in disguise. And I believe there are many people who will say, 2020 is the best thing that ever happened to me. It changed my life for the better. And if you are here today, and if you give your life to Christ, if you say yes to Jesus right now, that will be your testimony. That will be your testimony. And so if you're here today and you say, Sean, I, I want to receive Jesus. I want to receive Jesus. I, I want integrity. I want intimacy. I want identity. I want to know what it's like to resiliently endure hardship. Just raise your hand. Just slip your hand up. I'll wait for you. I know it's hot. It's hot. But I will melt in this sun if it means that you will come to Jesus today. Just raise your hand. I see you, brother. Anyone else? Raise your hand. If you're listening at home or from your couch or um, later on on YouTube, this is for you. You can raise your hand too. The cost to follow Jesus is nothing compared to the cost he paid to acquire you. But he will not violate your will. You gotta respond. So my last call, just raise your hand. Let's pray together. Father, huh, I thank you for Jesus. I thank you, Lord, that even as things fall apart for us, even as we suffer, even as the things that we put all of our hope and dependence on falls apart around us, we are so thank you that you are a solid rock. We thank you, Lord God, that even in hard times, you are producing great character in us and that there's something about suffering, there's something about crisis that forms us and shapes us into your image. And so Lord, do what you have to do in us. And if it took pandemic, if it took sheltering place, if it took uh, craziness to ensue for me to see you, it was worth it. Lord, for those who raised their hand and said, yes, I want Jesus, Lord, I pray that you would come into their, their lives that you would heal their hearts, that you would draw them near to you, help them to know by your spirit, confirm for them and testify that they are now children of God. Lord, we thank you for all you're doing in this place. In Jesus' name. And everyone said, amen, amen. God bless you guys. God bless you guys. Thank you so much for coming out to The Rock today, for enduring the hot heat with us. God bless you. We love you. We'll see you next week, all right? I'll see you.